Well, I've thrown a bit of time at this after work each night, and it's only been on the days where I felt like coming back and spending another hour or two of doing what I do all day, every day, anyway. So I've got the radiator support off it, and I've got the rails pretty much ready to cut and put our replacement section on. And the replacement section, I've got the inner fender skirts cut away on those, and we're pretty much ready to cut the rails. This morning I went through the GMH repair procedure and they tell me about replacing the rail and we can cut it between the two mounting points for the K-frame and they recommend a dog leg approach in here like this to join it together. So we'll get to that a bit further on. But first off, we need to look at the fact we've got this car on a hoist and now that we've got a significant amount of the weight removed, it becomes a little bit unstable on the hoist. So you've always got to protect yourself. Now, for all me old mates in the trade that have been doing this forever, we're all aware of the fact that you've got to load a two post hoist so that the car pretty much balances across the two poles, which is pretty easy to do when you've got an intact car. The hoist manufacturers build their product to support an intact vehicle. As Soon as you start taking out the engine, the transmission, all of the front suspension, this end of the car becomes a whole lot lighter than what it would have been originally and you put it on a two post hoist and you are in big danger of the whole car just flipping over backwards and coming off. So what we've got to do is to move the car further forward on the poles and get it so that we've got a lot of weight on the front pads. So I can't lift the front of this car off the two arms because I've got it positioned so far forward. But if I put it on the hoist in the position I normally would put this type of car on this hoist, it would be bum heavy and I run the big risk of it just falling off and squashing myself or someone else in the shed. So we'll lift it up and have a bit of a look at what we've done. These rear legs, I've got them swung as far forward as they possibly can go and I'm using my normal lift point on this car, which is the one the factory recommends, and it's the point where the rear suspension anchors into the car. With the car this far forward, I've got the front leg angled out and I've got it extended a long way out and it's coming up to just about where I'd normally lift. I would normally lift with it about here, but it doesn't really matter. I've got enough weight on the front of the car that it's not gonna go anywhere. Now, I don't recommend putting a prop under the back of the car, for the simple reason is you will forget it's there. Now, don't laugh, it happens. Had a young brother here yesterday, and he works in a busy dealership, and GMH, up until they closed, and they recently had an incident where one of their workers put a prop under the back of a vehicle because he didn't feel safe underneath it. He did the service work he needed to do and then it came time to lower the car. He walks around the prop that he'd put there himself, talking to his mate beside him, starts lowering the hoist down, not taking any notice of what he's doing. Next minute there's this almighty crash. The back of the car's lifted up, the prop's dropped out, the car's rocked over on an angle. Fortunately it just dropped down onto the rocker panels, the sill panels, and no great damage was done and nobody was hurt but it's pretty easy to forget about a prop and cause some problems. And that brings me to the most important thing. If you are raising a car or lowering a car, always watch the car. Never get distracted and be talking to someone else in the shed. You have got to watch that car raise and you've got to watch it lower just in case something's going pear shape. Keep that up, we'll all be safe. This is the replacement section I've salvaged from another car and I have done all the prep work bar cutting the rails. I've drilled all the spot welds and taken all the pieces I don't need off these sides and that's ready to go. Now on this side I've drilled the spot welds and I've taken all of the fender skirt out so when it goes back together my original skirt's got to slide in over the top of this bracket and tuck underneath this headlight support in there. On the other side my car was damaged so what I've done is I've cut the panel off across here and I've cut mine across and we'll push them together and we'll weld them together. And I've chosen a spot to weld that I can get in there, do the weld and finish the weld. But more importantly, I've chosen a spot that if this car's in a future accident and there's a catastrophic failure of the weld, unlikely but possible, it's not going to cause any great damage to the car because that piece has broken. The car will have as much support as what it would have done if it was already intact. Now, the battery fits in here, there's a brace underneath it, the likelihood that that would fail in an accident is so remote, it's, well, it's laughable that it would happen, but you've always got to be prepared for the worst. So if you are cutting up a car and welding a piece of another car to it, always choose the places where you cut and join it carefully. And at the very least, if it's a car built this century, late last century, 
there will be a repair procedure floating around somewhere and the internet gives us access to a lot of that. I've just spent a bit of time marking it all out and following GMH's outline on how they like to have them repaired. I've chosen to do it a little bit different to them, mainly because they talk about cutting up through the rail and across through this top plate in one go and joining it together. And it just, for me, goes against the grain a little bit. Where you've got a box section made from multiple pieces, I always like to just sort of stagger the join so that I will now have the top plate joined in a different spot to where the rail on the side is. Just a little bit extra precaution. GMH say we don't need it. And if this was a commercial smash repair operation, we wouldn't bother. This is my car and my time. I like to do it a little bit better than that. It will create a fair bit of work and it will be a bit of mucking around, not so much on the car, but more on the piece we're putting on there because we've actually got to come forward into the good part of the rail and cut this piece out of the center of it. And so not really difficult, just gonna be time consuming and a little bit fiddly on the corners. We're just gonna be a bit careful we don't cut into the good piece of rail. So we'll have a bit of a close look at how we've marked it out and then we'll move on from there. I've marked the waste side. For the car, it's going to be everything forward of these lines and GMH say 50 millimetres apart. So we've got a line that comes up where the bottom is cut across. It's going to run back through the centre of the rail and up again. You'll look at this distance here and it's wider than this distance down here. GMH say half the distance of the rail. Well, I've worked from this edge to the edge under the top plate. So that is half the distance of that area in there. So that will wind up in the centre. And the big thing is, is getting them all accurate. It's a fair bit of laying out and marking out to get eight sides all marked accurately. So it's a careful process and you've got to do a lot of measuring and checking to make sure that you've actually got the marks in the same place, side to side, and for the replacement piece to the original car. So I started by measuring the distance between the two holes for the suspension mounting from underneath the car and I used the edge of the holes punched in the sheet metal. So these two cars were made within a day of each other. They're going to be the same. I've measured them with the same measurement on both cars. GMH says to work on the centre line and on their approach they do the top part of the cut on the centre line, the bottom one comes forward 50 mil and drops down. I've chosen to shift it back so that I'm 25 mil either side of the centre line. So I've got the centre line right in the middle of my repair area and then my top plate is coming forward of there. So a little bit of a change there. So once I had a centre line, I could establish a 50 millimetre, well 25 mil either side of that line. I used my combination square and from the outside of the car with the frame of my square facing forwards every time, I have measured a straight cut line across the bottom of the rail. From that, I can use my set square and I used the same thing again, bulk of the square facing forward, measured down and lined it up against my combination square and I could pick the line up like that. Now we're always looking for easier ways to do things and I had done seven of the side rails. So I was on the last one, which happened to be that one over there. And I'm looking at old trusty square that I have owned since 1986 and I suddenly remembered it's 50 millimetres across here. All I needed was one measurement and just marked the other one off that. So I went back and I checked them all against the width of the square and there was only one of them was out by half a millimetre, so I'm pretty close. Now, I'm going to cut them and put them together and there is the possibility that there will be a bit of a mismatch because doing this many measurements and things like that from a damaged car, we could have a little thing where they are out of alignment a bit, but we will be within a safe welding distance. If they're too big, it's only a matter of grinding a little piece off it. So I don't see too many problems. To get the measurement up from the rail, it was just a matter of setting the set square, measuring up from the bottom, and then I marked all of the rails together without changing the setting on the set square, on the combination square, so that all works. So now it's just a process of starting to trim it up, and then we'll get into it and I'll describe some of it as I go, but initially, the quicker we can get rid of the waste material, the better. So because these front horns are damaged, I'm just gonna cut them off and get them out of my way. And then I can cut the rail through 
where I want the join in the top plate. And it doesn't matter because this is all waste. The only thing I've got to be cautious of is the inner fender skirt. And I can come up from the outside and cut that through without hurting anything there. And I can also cut downwards here and inwards from the outside. And I'll just wind up with this piece of waste material where the spot welds are and that'll be easy to get off from the outside of the car. So then I can trim straight up from the forward line, the 50 mil point, and then apart from the inner plate, all the outer rails will waste, so they can be cut off. I've pre-drilled these spot welds here, so they should be easy enough to break those off. Once I've got a straight line up through here and the material waste, the waste material gone, I can cut in along the parallel line, and then I can cut the vertical one again, so that should work. So we'll see what happens. The X's are marking the waste side, so naturally on this part, I will be cutting forward of this line and above this line and forward of this line. On the replacement piece, I'll be cutting behind this line, below here and behind this one here. And so they should butt back together and be the same dimension. We will have the top of the rail here as a reference. We will have the flat of the bottom of the rail there as a reference. Now our good friends that are in collision repair, they will have this car set up on a platform while they're working on it. They will have a measuring system in place and they can cut the car, they can put the car back together. Their equipment will give them the right height here. At home we don't have any of that flash equipment, we've got to do it a little bit old school. So how do we know we're in the right spot? Well, we know the measurement between the two holes for the suspension to bolt in. So when it comes back together, we know that's got to be right. We also know that the bottom of this rail is straight. So if we've got a join in the middle of it and we put the straight edge across the bottom of the join and we find out there's a big wowie this way or a big wowie that way and the straight edge wants to rock on it, we know automatically we're in the wrong place. Now, I've got a front cut from another car. It's all intact, it all lines up. So once my rail is straight on the bottom and parallel through here, it all works there. If the top of the radiator support panel is lining up on all these points here, we've got to be in the right spot. So we only need to know the engine bay measurement, but we don't even need to know that because we've got a paint line where the edge of the top panel lined up on it before. Providing we come back to that, it's all going to fit together. If we don't have any of that and we're putting it together and judging it, we can fit a fender on there. And we will know from the bolt holes in the fender, if they all line up with centres on the centres in the car frame, we know that's all in the right spot there. So there's always ways around it that we can actually be checking it all the time without big flash measuring equipment. And that's how we're doing it today. Now I'm all for doing labour saving ideas here. So what I've done was I needed to accurately mark each of these top plates where I wanted to cut them. And that's my scribe line there. So what I've done is I've cut a template that actually just drops into the rail and I've decided I'm going to cut it 10 millimetres back from the edge of this opening. So all I've done is put the ruler in there and measured against the edge of the plate 10 millimetres and I've scribed across. So I've marked it top right because the rails are mirror imaged. So to do the left hand one, I've just turned it over and marked it like that and then the same thing on the car. I should have all my lines in exactly the same spot that once I've cut it, fit it together, it all should line up because of the template. Now I'd originally thought about making a template for the sides of the rails, but it just wasn't practical to make something that was going to work for both sides of each rail and be able to transfer it easily between the two. So I went with sitting there with the ruler, I spent an hour or so just getting it all lined up and worked. So the proof of the pie will be in the eating, so we'll chop it up and see what happens.
Gloves are always a good idea when you've got this much sharp metal around. These bird edges are razor sharp, guys. Just respect them. Now what I did here, you would have seen me doing it with the angle grinder. This is a piece of waste. I'd already drilled the spot weld, but because it's thicker material here, it's got quite good solid um, welds in it. Although I drilled it, it just wasn't quite through. So what I've done is not cutting too deep that they go all the way through is I've just put some cuts across it with the angle grinder and then it made it very easy to snap it off. And we're still left with a lump of weld there to grind away, but it was just a quick and easy way of doing it. And I do use that method quite often where it's a piece of waste on the outside that I'm just gonna throw away. This is our butt up to line at the bottom here. So the new piece will come up to that. And we've got to cut this square out of here to give the little dog leg section to give it its strength in the weld. Now, I've cut into that rail a little bit there, so once this is out the way, I can repair that with the welder and just grind it back flat. And depending on how our spot welds line up will be whether I fill these holes in, but I'm hoping because these cars were built with robots that the welds will be in the same spots and we can just line it up there and put a plug weld through and it'll do all that in one go. And that's about it, I think we've got him all good. So I've just got to grind this smooth across the front. I've got a little, couple of little bit of lumps and bumps there, but they're all forward on line, there's no problem there and we'll get into it. But already it's going to be a nice strong weld. It's got that dog leg in it. It's got the plate welded in a different spot. It's gonna be great. I left a little bit of material in the back there just so I wouldn't nick into the rail like I did here. And now I've just had to remove it then. So we'll just give that a little bit of a tidy up, but we're just above that little scribe line, just forward of that one there. So that all should line up nice. Got our step in there. We've got our top plate in there and the inner skirt going all the way along. Now to be able to weld this, I've got two choices. When the new piece goes in, I can actually just V a piece out of here on the outer plate, which you're gonna slide over the top and weld the inner section in place, or we can do it with the inner fender skirt. Now, given that we've got quite a nice thick rail on the outside, it makes reasonable sense to do it from the outside. So if we just come bring it up, prepare it, and then just cut into the outer piece and grind it up, and um, we can just fill the hole up with weld and it's just like a huge spot weld in there joining the two together. I'm just cutting this out now, and here's a handy thing to actually bear in mind if you're doing any cutting away sort of work. I've cut through this halfway through there and there, just so that I'm not going to damage the material behind it. But what I've done is I've driven my little chisel in behind it, and I've got a bit of clearance all the way through. So now I'm gonna split it down the middle, and then I can break these two pieces off very easily without any risk of cutting the piece of metal behind it. Just easy way of getting it apart without actually causing other damage to the material we want to preserve. And we've got a little spot weld hiding in there too by the looks of it. So 
what we might do is just put a couple of little slices across it and it'll probably break off. I'm just getting ready for a bit of a dry run here. I'm gonna push the whole thing together and see how it looks. I do know that on the driver's side, the right-hand side, I've got a little bit of extra material there I've got to trim back, but we'll just sit it together and hopefully it'll just overlap itself and I can run a scribe line across and trim it to the exact size. But it's all looking pretty good, but we're really at the do or die moment. Like if I've mucked up any of these measurements, um, it's just not gonna work, is it? So we could be looking for the front of another car yet. So we'll see how we go. Because of the angles, I'm probably going to have to get it completely underneath and just sort of pick it up. I've also got to weave this little piece of fender skirt over the top of one rail and under another. So I'm not entirely certain how it's all going to work yet. In the factory, this is all assembled in pieces. So the radiator support would not be on at the same point that the rails are on and the inner skirt's not. So we're just gonna have to weave it through and hopefully it'll go together and we'll still be able to get it apart again. But it's all a little bit of a hit and miss and a little bit of experimental at this stage. These frame rails spread the further forward they come in the car. So with it extended out a little bit, the inner guard's not quite in the right spot. So I've had to lever that over and maybe to make it a bit easier to get it apart and back together again, I might even bend these in a little bit so it'll slide in and out easier. But we've still got to come back nearly 50 millimetres, both sides. And so that'll tighten this up and the inner guard will sit in the right spot the further back we go. This part of the inner skirt has gone over the top of the lower support rail, which we can see down there through the hole, and it's starting to slide in underneath this headlight support bucket. So that's got to go forward, and once it's all in place, I'll mark through where I've drilled the spot welds out of with a marker, and if they don't line up with these spots that I've drilled the original spot welds from, I'll have to plug these up and just grind them off smooth and then a bit of weld through primer and we'll be able to put it together. On this side, this is the area here where I'll have to trim it back a little bit. So what I really want is for this panel to sit on top of the original and then I can just trim this across here and trim this one across there and we'll be able to do a nice butt weld on there. And as I was talking before, looking at the size of these welds, if this car's in a future accident and these actually fail catastrophically, it's no big drama because when you look at all this material here that's welded together everywhere, 
I think it's virtually impossible that you're going to have a problem with these and even if they did fail the car's already too far bent it's working on the crumple zones in here and in here by this point and we don't have any problem now looking at the way GMH has specified to weld this rail together it's very unlikely that that would fail in an accident situation but if it did they've made the precaution that it's either side of the suspension mounting points so there's the big steel K-frame that goes underneath here and the K-frame I've mentioned a few times already in the video it's called a K-frame because it looks like a big letter K viewed from the top so it's got a rail that runs all the way across the back and then there's two arms that face out that pick up these holes on the front so it looks like a giant capital K. So if we had a failure at this point in an accident we've got it bolted to the K-frame and this little portion of the rail is designed to remain in a straight situation anyway because we've got crumple points here, crumple points here, and crumple points back here around the K-frame. So crumple point in there, and a crumple point in there, and we've got this little weave in the line here is actually the crumple point, and there's a little kink down in here which is a little pre-fold, and another one there, and this is where my original rail had failed, and there was a big depression in here from the crumple point. This section at the back, you can see these little flutes in here. It's where it's designed to crumple, but that's how they look from factory. There's no damage to that part of it already. With the impact that we experienced, the car did everything it was designed to do. The front part of the rail, the energy absorbing front bumper, took up all the impact, and it saved not only the occupants, but the main structure of the car as well. So we're just doing a minor repair on the front of it. So I'm going to push it all together now and hopefully it'll all line up. We can mark all our holes and things that we have to do our little bit of minor work to. Take it all apart, prep it all, put some weld through primer on all the areas we have to and then it should just be a case of pushing it together and welding it where it touches. One of the best body repair tools ever made is the trusty old Holden jack. Because they're a little screw up jack, you can set them anywhere you want, you can creep on your adjustments and just walk your way into things. So, looking at the open gaps I've got around the car, it's looking like we're going to wind up being pretty close. This side we are tight for some reason. Clearly just wasn't holding my mouth right. Yeah, we're moving the car on the hoist. Whenever you're putting things together like this and something seems tight or wrong, there's usually a good reason. And what's happened down here is two of the spot weld holes I've drilled have broken through the bottom web. And it's made a little tab and one piece has gone the wrong side of this new piece of rail in there. So I'm going to have to drop it down again, get that little piece folded into the engine bay and then lift it again. Okay, that makes a difference. Just lifts in there quite happily now. Grab 
a few clamps and we'll start clamping a few things in place and just see where we're going. I'm not all that worried about being too high or too low at this stage. I just want it clamped together so I can get the other side to sit in and then we'll start fiddling with it. Okay, we're buttoned there. We're not buttoned up here. Just lift him up and check some measurements. Alrighty. So somewhere in here I have written the measurement for the rail. Could have 374 millimetres between these. And what do you know, we have got 370 four with that butter there and on this side we have got 300 and more 379 so we've got five mil to cut off this one for some reason so how we manage that I don't know so we've got a gap on this side but not on the inside it's still not five millimeters so what we'll do is push it together and trim the inside a bit and then work out what we're going to do. And that one there, I'll just hit him up in the air a little bit. So it runs over the top. Should be able to hook him out the way. Luckily, we've got one that's right and one that's wide. So it's not like we've got to fill a big gap in. Now, I have using metric measurements because this car was designed and built with metric measurements. So we're down to a four millimetre difference now. So what I might do is just rip a bit of that off with a cutting wheel and see where we're at. Come down a bit. We up against each other there. Yep. All right, so now we can trim a bit out of there. Out of Doesn't matter, I'll just run a cutting, I'll put a wider cutting disc in there and just cut the line. Right. And we're also butted in here on the top rail as well, so there's a bit going to come out of that as well. Whereas the other side needs a little bit scribing off that. So this side we know is right, so if I grab my scriber, it's overlapping in there. So I'll just um, scribe that and I can make sure, in fact, I'm not quite on the line, I can just grind that grey piece off a little bit on the inside edge. Now I've got it mostly butted together but I'm out by a good four millimetres so with our centre section in here right on the butt lines joined up I'm just going to put a three mil cutting disc just straight up one of my cuts and down the dog leg on the other one and that'll take three millimetres off and then we can reassess it. If it's still too proud we can go back to the thinner cutting disc and once we push it together again, and that'll take a little slim, thin slither off, and we can just creep it in little bit by little bit rather than taking a big chunk off at a time and removing too much material. This is why we do the dry run. This gap up in here, which is fine, that'll close it up by three millimetres, but my top plate is pinching in this outside corner. So 
The inside looks like we've almost got three millimetres there, no worries at all. But what I'll have to do is do a nothing cut here and a three millimetre wide cut on this inside edge here. So probably take it off the green bit might be easy. It's going to be six of one half dozen the other because I've got on the green part of the car, I've got this inner skirt in the way. On the grey part, I've got the outer rail. But I think I might do the green one. So it's basically come from nothing on this side, a full three mil on the outside, and I can put my chisel in between the skirt and the top plate there and just lever that out the way. And we'll go from there, which is probably why GMH said to cut them through in a straight line. It's for ease of repair. I'm just being a little bit pedantic and doing this step in the top plate, but it will make it a much nicer job at the end of the day. Worth the effort anyway. Got a few little burrs where it's not cut quite up where I was just trimming to a corner, like there, where it's propping it. Same thing on the bottom of that one there, and there's a big the rail in the back there. So I'll just get there and clean those off, and we'll take the burrs off it, and I should be able to just about put it together for good. Got this little piece up here to trim off, and we'll get into it. Just looking for any little imperfections that want a little bit of a tap out and a move before we push it together. Might just grind that across there. Must be improving, it's getting easier to push it together. Just about have it. No, we are still 375, but we've got about a one mil gap. To so pull it in, we should have 374. Perfect. That's got it trimmed up. It fits together pretty good. I've got a loose measurement at 375, but if I push the two pieces together and close that gap up, I get 374. So that's all good to go. I'm going to mark all of these holes that I've drilled through for the plug welds, and any of them that are too far away from where the original car was welded, I'll weld those little divots up that I caused with the drill bit. Um, so any of them that are too far out of alignment from where I drilled the original spot welds out, I'll just go through and I'll weld the car up where the little end of the drill bit's gone into it. And once that's done, we can weld through primer at all, and we can push it all together, and we can glue it together with a hot glue gun. It'll be good.
I was expected with a car of this type that if it had been put together with a robot, the program would have been loaded in the robot and every spot weld on every car would be in the same spot. But we do have a little discrepancy, so obviously there are some manufacturing tolerances there. But it's no big drama. Any of the major divots that are out of whack, I'm just going to weld those up and it'll all be good. That feels pretty good across there. That's buffed up. And we have got that pretty much in line from a car repair point of view. Just so providing we've got our right measurement, we should be able to just about weld that together. Three hundred and seventy-four, right? Which is exactly what we want. I'll just make myself a spot that I can hook my earth clip onto and get a good connection. That's about as good as it's going to get. Are you out the way? Yes. Right, it's going to weld a little bit at the top. And then I'll hammer this in with the down side. I just ground these edges off. There was a tiny little burr on the edge from where I'd actually cut the sheet metal, and so I couldn't actually feel across for it to be flat. Now, anywhere where it's ground flat across the two, naturally it's automatically in line, and I don't really want to be putting any filler inside the engine compartment, so the plan is to just put it together, grind it off, and then we'll paint it. So we've got a high spot here. You can see the shadow of the old primer just beside that. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we're going to hammer that one in a little bit. Once we can get a smooth line across there, I can weld that through. So we've got that now, and most of this is pretty good. This line here, I'll get this edge welded here a little bit before we start working our way up the top here, but as you can see, that wobbles in and out a bit. But I want to be able to get this in line and curl any distortion out of that. It's got a little bit of a curl in this top, this top piece here. But we can get a bit more weld done on that, and we should be good. Now with this front piece coming off another car, we know they were all pressed in the same factory and in this case only a day or so apart. So we know that all of these top panels will be exactly the same. Now I've masked along the old paint line here when I did the weld through primer. So we're up against that line now so we know we've got this front panel back in the right spot. So it's just another way of checking where you're at 
is to use the old paint lines and edges. So I'll just get these to sit in a bit flatter. And I can clamp it all down and I can weld the top together and then I can lift the car and do what I want with it and nothing's going to move. got it all welded together and ground off now and the next step is pretty important. What I'm going to do is just go around and I'm going to be looking for any little imperfections in the weld. So I'm looking for little spots of porosity where there's been a little bit of paint burnt or something like that or the gas has blown away or something while I've been welding and these are little weak points in the weld so I'm going to fill those and then I'm also looking for pieces I haven't welded and it's pretty easy doing plug welds to actually weld a spot and when the little puddle of weld grows out you've got one little side there you get a little half moon where you next to the hole you've drilled that hasn't actually completely filled with weld so I'm looking for all of those as weld and I'm filling those it is very good but it's just one of those things it's a pretty important stage the other thing is I've got to look at the rails where I've welded those mainly from the point of view that we welded it a little bit by a little bit. So I welded probably about 20 mil at a time, so that's three quarters of an inch. If I've got a little spot between two welds where the weld hasn't quite met up in the middle and I've got a tiny little gap there, it's on a chassis rail. So that has got the potential that with vibrations and movements that a crack could start from that point and start working its way through the weld and we could have a catastrophic failure. So it's a very important stage. You need to have a very good look at everything and if you can see any little imperfections then it's a case of just going back and spotting them up with the welder and grinding them off afterwards. So I'm going to go around and I'll mark all the spots I want to weld so I'm not looking for things as I'm going and then I'll come in with the welder, weld them all up, grind them all off and we should be ready to move on to primer.
twins. Selfie twins. <laughs> yeah.